Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Union's penultimate panel event of term. I'm your host, Keir Bradwell, Speaker's Officer-Elect, and I'm joined this evening by four deeply influential panellists, Martin Rees, Will Wilkinson, Alice Hill and Roger Hallam. This term, the Union has spent an awful lot of time investigating what the coronavirus crisis means moving forward. But before this, there was another crisis on everyone's lips, climate change. Today, we hope our panellists will explain what our present situation means for the battle against global warming. We'll start by asking each to speak for around five or six minutes, and then in the second half of the event, we'll begin a more open discussion between each of us. If you'd like to ask a question, do leave a comment in the YouTube live chat and I should do my best to fit them in. And in the meantime, remember to subscribe to the Cambridge Union on YouTube, find us on Facebook, and of course, follow us on Twitter too. Now, the problem with introducing our first speaker tonight is that this man has done so many things, any attempt to introduce him by listing some of his achievements will inevitably do him a disservice. He's a Lord, a former master of Trinity College, the 60th president of the Royal Society, astronomer royal, author of hundreds of research papers, serial prize winner, deliverer of the Reef Lectures, and author of the absolutely superb book on the future, as well as this, our final century. I could go on, but instead I will simply offer Martin Rees the warmest of invitations this evening. Martin, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you very much and hello everybody. Uh, COVID-19 is a wake-up call. It reminds us that our entire interconnected world is getting more vulnerable to catastrophes that span the globe. We were complacent about the risk and we are still more about the long-term insidious risk of global heating. We're like the proverbial boiling frog, contented in a warming tank until it's too late to save ourselves. We still have an opportunity, an all too narrow window to drastically rethink how we minimize the chance of a real disaster. We need to ensure that climate change looms high on the agenda of politicians. And that's why it's encouraging to witness more activists, especially among the young who can hope to live to the end of a century and are outraged, quite rightly, at the short-term thinking that discounts their future. Their campaigning is welcome, their commitment gives ground for hope. The climate crisis is an impending global fever, resembling a slow motion version of COVID-19. For instance, both the crises aggravate the iniquitous levels of inequality within countries like ours, and also between rich and poor countries. During the pandemic, the lucky ones in this country continue to work in security from comfortable homes. The less lucky were hunkered down in cramped accommodation, and many have lost their jobs and are in desperate financial straits. And we've had a sanitary lesson on which jobs really matter. Medics, obviously, but also delivery drivers, carers, and so forth. How the status and pay levels of jobs correlates disgracefully poorly with their intrinsic value, and how grotesque current inequalities are. Let's hope this lesson isn't forgotten and will trigger political pressure for a fairer tax system. The pandemic is amplifying inequalities also between rich and poor nations. It's likely to cause more human tragedies in the poorer countries of Latin America, Africa and Asia. Those in the megacities like Mumbai or Lagos, they can't isolate, they don't have enough clean water and sanitation and their medical care is minimal. And likewise, those countries and the poorest people in them will suffer the most from global warming and the effects on food production and water supplies. And another thing, if humanity's collective impact pushes too hard, the resultant ecological shock could wipe out many species. We'd be destroying the book of life before we've read it. And biodiversity is a crucial component of human well-being. And for many environmentalists, preserving the richness of our biosphere has value in its own right, over and above its importance to us. To quote E.O. Wilson, mass extinction is a sin that future generations will least forgive us for. Something else that pandemics and climate change have in common 
is that coping with both involves more but differently focused science. Biotech is plainly crucial in tackling pandemics for diagnostics, vaccine development, and so forth. But it's going to be tough to meet our declared net zero targets for climate without a drastic speed up in developing novel technologies for energy generation, storage, smart grids, etc., and of course, for energy saving strategies. But the most compelling incentive for accelerating our clean energy R&D is this. Meeting our UK net zero target, challenging though it is, makes less than 2% difference to the world's global emissions. But the developing countries of Asia and Africa, they can't reach what we consider acceptable living standards without having rather more per capita energy generation than they do today. They've got to get away from smoky stoves, burning wood and dumb to some clean energy. And moreover, it's the CO2 emissions from those countries which matter more to the world and indeed to us. We must hope that their growth will be far greener than Europe's has been, that they learn from our mistakes. But if the UK can secure a lead in producing more efficient and affordable carbon-free energy generation, then we can help India and other vast developing markets to leapfrog directly to clean energy rather than building coal-fired power stations. Our efforts could thereby make a far bigger percentage difference to the needed global shift towards zero net carbon emissions. Likewise, incidentally, the UK's expertise in plant science could give us special leverage in helping all countries to feed themselves with intensive high-tech agriculture without encroaching still more on the lateral world. So in a country like ours, it would be hard to think of a more inspiring challenge for young scientists and engineers than to deploy and develop expertise and to provide food and clean energy for ourselves and more important, for the developing world, nor indeed a better investment in our own future. Spaceship Earth is hurtling through the void. Its passengers are anxious and fractious. Their life support system is vulnerable to disruption and breakdowns. But there's too little planning, too little horizon scanning. And we really do need to think globally. We need to think rationally. We need to think long term empowered by 21st century technology, but guided by values that science itself can't provide. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. Martin, uh, thank you very much for those thoughts indeed. Our second speaker tonight is Will Wilkinson, who, before assuming his current role as Vice President of Policy at the Niskanen Centre, was a correspondent for The Economist and remains a regular columnist, uh, a columnist at The New York Times. Will, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kier. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor to uh, be part of this very uh, eminent panel. Uh, I'll try to do my best to hold up my end. Um, the topic uh, for our panel this evening is, is, is extremely stimulating. I've been thinking about it for, for weeks, just you know, turning the parallels between the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis over and over in my mind. And there are you know, many, many parallels. But before we get to the parallels, I think it's you know, kind of important to see that they might directly affect one another in some ways. Um, you know, one thing we could talk about is you know, the decrease in energy demand that has been driven by the uh, pandemic, uh, the, the economic slowdown that was necessitated by mass quarantine and stay at home orders, you know, it's created a deep dip in energy demand. Uh, people are obviously commuting less to work, they're taking fewer trips to the store. Um, and that's creating a significant reduction in, in transportation based emissions. Um, and that's not a bad thing. People are, you know, have noted that in many cities that the skies look clearer and 
the, you know, pe astronomers are like, oh, I can see the stars, uh, you know, much more vividly now. Um, you know, streams and rivers uh, that are generally murky have, you know, become uh, a little nicer to look at, more transparent and lucid. So these are all uh, some nice effects. Um, there are some other, you know, good effects. My understanding is that, you know, when you have a big drop in energy demand, coal plants, uh, which are among our dirtiest sources of energy, are among the first to shut down. Um, and some of these may stay shut down, which would be a good thing. That could accelerate the transition to cleaner energy sources. Um, at the same time, you know, we probably shouldn't overestimate the effect of this kind of reduction in demand for energy um, wrought by the epidemic. Um, the consumption of energy with manufacturing and industry uh, is a large part of overall energy usage. It hasn't slowed down all that much. Um, and additionally, like less developed countries who find themselves with ex you know, extremely strained budgets due to global recessions uh, may find themselves reaching for the cheapest and dirtiest forms of energy. Uh, and that could have um, a very negative effect, um, but that's not inevitable. That's something that we can do something about. Cleaner sources of energy are now you know, pretty competitive in terms of price. Uh, the difficulty with uh, some less developed countries is that many of them lack the technical capacity to, and the trained workforces that are needed to get uh, you know, a clean energy infrastructure into place. So wealthier countries um, will need to help them if we're to fully take advantage of the, uh, of, of the you know, little margin uh, that we've gotten in carbon reduction from the COVID-19 slowdown. Um, in terms of the parallels between the th between these two crises, uh, which Lord Reese pointed out, some of them. Um, one thing that's really stuck out to me is the extent to which the problems in managing them in the places that have had problems in managing it, places like the US and the UK, uh, is that there's a sense of skepticism about mainstream science. Um, sometimes there's a um, an impulse to say that the right is anti-science. Um, I don't think that's quite right. I don't think there's an anti-science thing going on. It's more of a you know an iconoclastic embrace of alternative you know alternative authorities. You know, uh, people are you know always trotting out an expert. It's just like you know a a different expert, the one that agrees with them. Now it, it's it's easy to see where this came from in the climate debate. Um, there were you know pretty clear vested interests um, in uh, you know carbon intensive. Uh, Energy use, um, you know, though they weren't, they aren't, you know, Exxon's role in uh, promoting uh, alternate narratives about what's going on uh, is not too hard to see, um, and so you can see where, you know, how this kind of iconoclasm and 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 tendency to go to alternative theories of what's going on uh, were driven by, you know, some big economic interests. But in the case of the epidemic, it's it's in no one's interest to allow a, a you know a virus to run riot and ravage the population and hammer the economy. Um, but I think once the pattern of skepticism about expert authority and consensus gets established, it tends to take on a life of its own. And I think we've seen that here in the U.S. And I think probably there's been some similar things in in the U.K. Uh, where the 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 experts that we ought to be listening to just aren't lent the credence that they deserve. Um, in both cases, the, the, the pandemic and climate change, doing something about them requires a combination of, you know, on the one hand, political will, and on the other hand, state capacity. State capacity is just the you know, ability of the state to get done what it means to get done. Um, and you can see how these things have gone together in countries that have done well with COVID-19, like New Zealand, Korea, South Korea, Germany. Um, they clearly had the will to tackle the problem early and their states had the capacity to do what they needed to do. Um, and it's telling that those countries have also done well in carbon reduction, in transition to clean sources of energy, um, there's a general ethos in these places where the state is capable of making these changes and there's political will behind them. Um, here in the US, um, one of the 
long-term issues is that the political right has for decades been kind of undermining the state's capacity to do a lot of things well. Um, and when you undermine its ability to do things well, um, you also undermine the sense that it's worth asking the state to do it. If it can't do it well, why ask it to do it? So that you get a drop in the kind of political will behind a certain kind of initiative. Um, there's a sense that it can't work. Um, one of the ironies here is that, you know, the US has you know, immense state capacity in the military and disease control was always one of our strengths. The CDC was an example for countries around the world. Um, so there was state capacity there that, that easily could have been de deployed to handle the problem, um, but there was little political will. Um, in fact, there was a lot of political will behind undermining um, the um, this competency that our government has. Um, in both cases, I think there's a, a tendency to conflate market-based approaches with um, approaches that just advantage incumbent business interests. Um, and by, so the application of a you know, beefy carbon tax is a market-based approach. It's trying to um, structure a market that takes into account the social costs of uh, carbon emissions um, and uh, market mechanisms are doing the the rationing for you. Uh, that's different from an approach that is, you know, somehow we're we need to solve this problem by giving some subsidies to some current businesses that are important to some political constituency, right? Like that tends not to solve the problem um, because, of course, the you know incumbent businesses are have deep vested interests in the status quo, in, this, in the status quo structure of markets. And so if you have a proposal for restructuring a market, you're gonna create a lot of losers among um, incumbent business interests. So they tend to resist it. Um, but that force is so powerful in the US at least that there's, there's so little um, there's so much resistance to any structural transformation that can deal with the problem that we're just left as a default with some strategy of adaptation. Like, like eh, we can't figure out any form of collective action that will effectively contain the problem. So we're just gonna have to come up with ways to get along. Um, we're gonna have to figure out ways to adapt and live with it. And I think we've seen exactly the same thing here um, in both the case of the coronavirus epidemic and in climate change, where um, the U.S., you know, just failed to do everything it needed to do early on, um, it failed to produce the number of tests, it failed to implement a testing and tracing regime, um, it squandered the time that it had from these shutdowns, um, and then there was a huge political and business constituency for just opening the economy up again. And now that's just where we are. That's the equilibrium. Um, we're opening up the economy in the midst of, you know, rising rates of infection in many parts of the country. And we're just going to muddle through. Um, that's just what we're going to do. Uh, and that's what we're aiming to do with climate change as well. Uh, we're just not going to be able to get around to doing anything important. So we're just going to have to figure out ways to, you know, raise people's houses and, you know, hope that, you know, neighborhoods don't flood. Um, so I think I've gone through most of my time, um, but I'll, I'll just leave us with one more, which is that the experience of living through the epidemic and through climate change, I think are sort of similar. They're, you know, kind of really diffuse phenomena, right? Like they, they, they you know, until it really hits you, it seems remote, it seems like abstract, it seems like something for somebody else. Um, and in each case, the, the, the fact that the, the impact of the problem is borne disproportionately by the vulnerable, I mean, that's what it means to be the vulnerable, that you're the first one to get hurt. Uh, it, it, the, 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 the effects are, are semi-randomly distributed, but they're very unequally distributed as, as, as Lord Rees pointed out. Um, and the fact that uh, poorer people, less advantaged people, um, um, the minorities, immigrants, uh, classes of people that have been um, 
systematically disadvantaged over centuries, that those are the first per people to get hit uh, in either case, again, makes it difficult to generate the political will when you have a political system that is dominated uh, disproportionately by comfortable middle class people who are not the class of people who are most likely to bear the brunt of the problem. Uh, and that's something that we're going to have to address deeply. We're going to have to get people who may not personally experience a huge downside from the crisis to understand that the effects of it are brutal to other people and that they have some kind of obligation to care about that. I'll just leave it there. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much for those contributions, Will. Um, I'd now like to introduce Alice Hill, Senior Fellow of Climate Change Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. In November, she released a co-written book exploring how policymakers could mitigate the climate crisis. And before that, she worked as a special assistant to President Barack Obama. Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm really delighted to have this chance to join you today. When I worked uh, in the Obama administration, I worked on both biological threats and climate change. And I would be asked, what would it take to end the climate crisis? And in that time, I would say privately, I never wanted to be quoted, that it would take a pandemic. Well, of course, I've been proven terribly wrong on that. The pandemic, as we've heard, will not and the climate crisis. We've seen a reduction in our emissions about 17%, but by the measurements of the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the Mauna Loa Observatory, where the United States has been measuring for over six decades, uh, we're hitting historic amounts. Uh, 416 parts per million, that's more than the Earth has experienced for millions of years. And the emissions, even as we cut emissions in our economic response to the pandemic, continue to mount. And of course, those past emissions will continue to heat up the globe, even if we find a solution that will cut our carbon to zero now or in the very near future. As I've thought about what COVID shows me, it shows me that humans just don't prepare well in the face of great uncertainty. And my evidence for that is that there are stacks upon stacks of reports, ones I've participated in, ones I've read, that for both pandemics and climate change, they warn it will happen. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. But our preparations, our willingness to address these issues has been at best sluggish. And that's particularly ironic because our ability for foresight has never been better. As we've heard, we have more technological expertise, the sensors that exist, artificial intelligence, machine learning. We know a lot more about what's happening than we've ever known before, which gives us greater predictive powers but we haven't been able to use those powers to act. And that's truly unfortunate because we know if we act now, it'll save us both money and lives. Studies in America show that for every dollar we spent in reducing risk now, we save $6 in recovery. And that's not mentioning with climate change, the loss in biodiversity, the long-term loss to really large parts of the world to greater heat and sea level rise. But most, if not all nations have simply declined to invest deeply in addressing catastrophic risk. My hope is that our collective experience, the fact that virtually all of us have experienced COVID will help us understand better how we could address climate change. First that, COVID has provided us a stress test. You know, that's something we sought uh, and we really haven't seen a uh, pickup in our financial institutions yet. Uh, Bank of England was going to do some stress testing, testing on climate change, but that's been postponed. And we just haven't seen that yet, but I think COVID gives us a great stress test for what a catastrophic risk looks like when it unfolds. 
And they both involve deep uncertainty. We still don't know how COVID will end. Will it take a vaccine? Is there uh, herd immunity? All questions that we need science to help us answer. And we have many questions about what climate will look like, where it will occur, when it will occur, but we know it will happen. So can we use this experience to better understand what concurrent consecutive compounding risk looks like? And we are experiencing that because we're also experiencing climate change right now. If you look at what India and Bangladesh and the Philippines have experienced with typhoons this year, 3 million people evacuated during a pandemic. How difficult it is to social distance and keep people safe under those conditions in Bangladesh and India. And then India was not only hit on its west coast, but its east coast. It also has experienced extreme heat and now has a locust invasion that can just cut through fields, gobbling food very quickly. So we are seeing how this can all come together in a way that will be very deeply, uh, very difficult for any nation to handle. And now of course we have it occurring on a global basis. This pandemic also has given us each a personal understanding of what a catastrophic looks and feels like. We can feel the economic contraction. It hits differently, but certainly we are experiencing globally a economic contraction that is not familiar to any of us in our lifetimes, a contraction with no certain end date or clarity on how far it will reach. And it's exposed these deep chasms in our society where some people can fare well economically and others are just devastated and where the disease hits those as we've heard who are still not in their homes working on their computers but out providing service to the rest of us. It showed us how travel and trade, urban density, lack of, ac lack of access to clean water and sanitation can increase the risk to particular populations. And it's also shown us how individual steps we take can aid collective action to reduce the spread of the disease by staying home, wearing a mask, washing our hands. We can all reduce risk for others. COVID also provides, I believe, an opportunity for governments to place risk reduction at the heart of this recovery, where it should be. That means making sure we're looking at risk when we make any investments out of the trillions of dollars that we're seeing governments pour into responding to COVID to make sure that those investments are resilient and that they will help build a better future. And that of course means that some of those investments must go to promoting cleaner, cleaner energy and reduction of emissions to keep the globe safer going for, forward. There won't be a vaccine for climate change. And in fact, climate change brings a particularly unique challenge. Pandemics have been with human history pretty much ever since it's been written. The Athenian plague, the Black Plague, the Spanish flu 100 years ago, and now COVID-19. But climate change brings entirely new risks. We're seeing change at a pace that has never before been witnessed in human history. It's accelerating. I recently saw a headline, it said, climate change is not the news, the pace of change is the news. And that's what we're seeing simultaneously as we struggle with COVID-19. So the challenge is, can we cap capture the saliency of this cataclysmic event for all people on earth and use it to address this existential threat that's already materialized, but that if we act on it now, we can change the course of what will unfold. So I wanna leave you just now with a quote I have when I first really started working on climate change, I was looking at it from the angle of national security risks opposed by climate change. 
And I came across, uh, worked with a panel of retired military admirals and generals who themselves were becoming concerned about the very dire risks to global security, human security, and national security posed by climate change. And the chair of that panel, General Gordon Sullivan, he's the former chief of staff of the US Army, said this, which I've held on to tight. We can't wait for 100% certainty. If we wait for 100% certainty on the battlefield, something bad will happen. Well, COVID-19 has thrown us onto the battlefield and we can't wait to act. Let's see if we can use this terrible event to propel us to a much better future with regard to the catastrophic risk of climate change. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much for those thoughts, Alice. Finally tonight, I'd like to introduce Roger Hallam. Roger is co-founder of the global environmental activist movement Extinction Rebellion, theorist of civil disobedience and author of Common Sense for the 21st Century, Only Nonviolent Rebellion Can Now Stop Climate Breakdown and Social Catastrophe. Roger, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, well, I've done quite a few of these presentations, as you can probably imagine. And uh, one of the things I notice is, is when people are talking about the climate crisis, and let's call it a climate crisis to start off with rather than climate change, okay? <laughs> um, there's just an avoiding of actually getting down to what the actual figures and the killer facts are. You know, we're just endlessly told that there's this problem and it's quite amorphous and way off and what have you. But the fact of the matter is, over the last 10, 20 years, we pretty know, much know what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is mass starvation and social collapse. And that's already locked in. I just want to say that again, because I think it's important to sort of grasp what we're talking about here. We're talking about mass starvation and social collapse in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. No one quite knows, but we know it's coming. And the reason we know it's coming is because it's physics, right? This isn't a matter of ideology. It's not a matter of personal opinion. It's a matter of physical laws. I think people may have noticed that in the press in the last few days, there's been a report coming out that has the new sensitivity and analysis on the climate. We're, when we get to 560 parts per million of CO2 equivalent, then we're going to be locked in and experiencing five degrees centigrade global temperature increase. We thought for about three or four decades it was going to be three degrees, which is a total catastrophe. Five degrees is in the territory of human extinction. In case you're not aware, five degrees centigrade is actually 10 to 15 degrees centigrade above today's temperatures inland, which means on a hot day, it's something like 20 to 25 degrees hotter than it is today, which means you can't grow food because you can't grow food over 30 degrees centigrade. What that means is mass starvation. What that means is a large part of the globe is going to become uninhabitable, not for a year or two, not for a decade, not for a century, but for tens of thousands of years, potentially forever. That's what we're facing. That's where we're going to. And it's the physics, right? It's not really open to debate anymore. I can give you a few other stats just to support it. At four degrees centigrade, the tropics are going to be uninhabitable for six months of the year, according to a recent paper. At 35 degrees centigrade and high humidity, the wet bulb effect lock is locked in. If people aren't aware of what, what the wet bulb effect is, maybe you should understand what it is because it means death in six hours. It means the body can't cool down. At two degrees centigrade, the estimate from a recent paper is a billion people will be subject to this sort of extreme heat. Subject to this sort of extreme heat basically means they're going to die or they're going to be on the move. And that increases by a billion people every degree centigrade. So that's three billion people at three degrees, two, two billion people at three degrees, and so on, up to five degrees. 
So where's all this nonsense about 1.5? We're going to keep below 1.5. Where's all this nonsense about two degrees? You know, we can stay below two degrees. Everyone knows in the scientific community, there's a carbon lag and there's a figure on it. You can look it up. It's around 0.6. So we're 1.1 at the moment, plus 0.6, I make that 1.7. So why is the whole scientific establishment winding away about 1.5 degrees? It's a mass delusion situation. And we can add on all the other things which individually would be a mass catastrophe on, on their own. They've cut down 17% of the Amazon at 20 to 25%. It goes into a feedback system, which means it dies back and it's gone. That means we're contributing carbon to the atmosphere because you haven't got the trees. We can throw in methane, we can look at forest fires, we can look at water vapor, we can look at a whole load of feedback me mechanisms that have already been locked in, which means even if we stopped putting carbon into the atmosphere tomorrow, we're already heading for a mass catastrophe. The other thing that people don't really talk about is what precisely does this mean for the average person, for the average British person, for the average student at Cambridge? Well, let's start off with what it means most, especially at the moment. It means economic collapse. What does economic collapse mean? It means that you're losing your jobs, you're losing your income, your house drops in value, you haven't got an education, the NHS collapses. If you thought that was completely ridiculous, think about what's happened for the last three months. What happens next is hunger. Hunger is a driver of social collapse. If you don't understand that, then look at some history. When people get hungry, they start killing each other. It's very rapid and it's not pretty. What happens after that is war, rape, starvation, death. Have a look at what happened in the Second World War. Let's have a look at what happened in the Congo. This is what happens when societies collapse. And in case you don't quite get it, this leads to human extinction. Human extinction through mass heat, through loss of habitat, through starvation, and through a reduction in oxygen. And you can look that last one up because I haven't got enough time to explain it. So what does this mean practically? What does it mean? in terms of morality. One of the things that all these discussions do is they tend to imply we've got some sort of natural crisis here. We haven't got a natural crisis here. We've got a situation of catastrophic, unbelievable criminality. We know that these effects are being created by policies put in place by people with names and addresses. They're the top politicians and they're the people running the companies. These people are engaged in the mass murder of the human race. That's the situation. So how does this relate to COVID? Well, COVID is a, just a small little preclude, isn't it? A little example. We know it was in the papers last week that the British establishment is so embarrassingly stupid that it can't understand the exponential function. If it shut down the British economy a week earlier than it did, it would have saved 20 to 30,000 lives. That's not very impressive for Cambridge and Oxford, is it? Because these people educated these people who can't even understand something as basic as looking what happened in China and looking what happened in Italy. It wasn't like we didn't know. And now we've got 20 to 30,000 grieving families and a massive amount of necessary suffering. This tells us two things. The elites are unbelievably stupid and they're unbelievably uncaring. That's the situation. What does this mean practically? What does it mean like this week? I'm talking to mothers this week who are in tears because they know their children are gonna die. I'm talking to young people this week who don't see any point doing an education, don't see any point in the future because they know they're going to be starving to death. What does it mean for Cambridge students joining the elites? It means in 10 or 20 years time, they're going to be administrating, administrating the response 
to mass starvation. We're entering endless war. That's what the new generation is looking at, and that's what Cambridge students are looking at. So what's the solution? You'll notice from the other three speakers and from the establishment generally, there's no talk about the obvious solution. It's a historically illiterate perspective because everyone knows what the solution is. The solution is rebellion. To take down the governments and replace them with people's assemblies who will actually get on with the job. We've had 20, 30 years of catastrophic failure and now it's time to act. Mass civil disobedience works, mass protest works. We've just seen that with Black Lives Matter. What we need is thousands of people on the street. And I invite the Cambridge students and anyone listening to this to get in touch with Extinction Rebellion. The rebellion is going to be back on the go later in August, in September. This isn't just like an additional idea. You know, this is it. This is now. This is the reality we face. And what I'd like to suggest is it's quite slightly obscene to continue to analyze the situation. What we need to do is to talk about what we are going to do, what Cambridge University is going to do, what's it going to do with, what is it? 377 million pounds of fossil fuel investments. Why is it still investing? That's the key question for Cambridge University at the moment. Does it want to engage in continually catastrophically criminal activity. So what I'd like to ask the other three panelists is what's the plan? Seriously, guys, what's the plan? You know, let's talk about how we're going to respond. Let's interrogate 30 years of establishment failure. That's where I'd like to contribute. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roger, for those somewhat dystopian thoughts, uh, but not least for helping broaden out our debate. I will take on that question, actually, and, and open it up to the other panellists. Is there anyone here who um, would mount perhaps a defence of the um, establishment's involvement in, in climate politics? I see a hand from Martin Rees, so I will, I will pass over now. Well, I'm not sure. I'm certainly not going to defend our government. I mean, I think there are second rate uh, um, ideologues and chances. I've got no opinion of them at all. But I mean, I, I do uh, disagree with uh, uh, these conclusions, because first of all, um, uh, what we do in what matters for the climate is what happened in India. And the question is, what's Extinction Rebellion going to do to stop India building more coal-fired power stations, unless they can more cheaply have some sort of clean energy? And so my re recipe is that uh, we ought to be encouraging uh, researchers in the UK and worldwide to really have a blitz on clean energy R&D and deployment so that we can help India uh, to leapfrog directly to a carbon free economy um, and a less uh, devastatingly poor economy than they have now. So um, I think um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to turn England into a sort of a, um, anarchy and uh, do nothing for India is going to make the world far worse. So I think we want to uh, use the fact that we in the UK um, can, if we have this commitment and the idealism of young people, we can really make a big difference uh, if we um, accelerate um, R&D and redeploy effort away from say aviation into uh, clean energy and um, uh, also into better ways of growing food that are more uh, uh, robust against changes in climate. So I think the answer lies in science um, and uh, um, making a mess of the UK, which Extinction Rebellion would do, is going to do nothing for India and will make the world's situation worse. So I'm very strongly against uh, what's just been said. Um, might I ask, um, we've got a question here from the uh, YouTube live chat, which I think sort of feeds into this a little bit. Um, Louisa asks, how do we foster long termism into our political systems? Democratic systems by nature produce short term uh, time horizons. There is little incentive to focus long term, e.g. on mitigating ecological breakdown. Do we agree that there is some sort of fundamental weakness in the way that Western democratic systems are set up? And is that a something that will hold us back in dealing with coronavirus or with climate change? Is there anyone that would like to take that off? Perhaps one for Alice. Sure, I'll, I, I will uh, address the comments. For me, what COVID has illustrated is that 
we actually need strong governments to address catastrophic risk. As we've heard from Will, we've had a uh, focus on private markets. The uh, markets will solve this, private sector will solve this. I think COVID has made clear that the private sector cannot solve this on their own. They can be a partner, but we need strong governments. And with strong governments, we have uh, the necessary money to invest in the science and then uh, also provide the incentives to make the switch. Uh, and if we can focus on that, and in the United States, that would probably require us to do some campaign finance reform uh, so that we have politicians who are not uh, beholden to special interests. Uh, but we also need to have long term policies. You know, after World War II, after that experience of uh, the generation of young men, the United States saw great collective action by its government to build some great infrastructure structures that have lasted us now are in a failing state, uh, but that we need. So I think that uh, this disparagement of government is uh, short sighted. I cannot imagine that uh, uh, removing the government structures will allow us to organize sufficiently to uh, make the kinds of changes we need. And I think we need scientific investment to help us answer some of these questions that still plague us, including the technology that would allow us to remove carbon from the atmosphere at a scale that's economically feasible. So I would think we need to actually go in the different direction, but make sure that we have the political leadership that can lead us in the way we need to go. I think uh, Will would like to come in on that point. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment on the uh, the point about the democracy and long termism. Um, I don't think there's any particular problem with democracy that any other system doesn't have. Uh, and in fact, I think a lot of our democracies have some, you know, advantages and capacities that other kinds of systems lack. Um, and what we need to do is try to make the most of those. So here in the U.S. Uh, our democratic system isn't very democratic. As I mentioned before, the, the pain of both of these crises, crises fall you know, very disproportionately on uh, more vulnerable people. And those are precisely the people that our electoral system tends to underrepresent, that uh, our political system makes it very, very hard for people to vote. So the people who are most likely to get hurt are the people that are um, least empowered to have their voice heard in our democracy. And that creates problems. The point of part of the function of democracy is protective. It's for self-defense. You need to give people a voice so that they can speak up for their own rights and interests, that they have some mechanism that's going to defend them when they're in danger. And if you strip people of uh, equal protection of their rights and of their you know, political liberties, they're not going to be able to defend themselves. And that actually puts us in danger, right? Like the, the, the people who are most likely to be hurt are the people who are most likely to deliver the political will to do something about it. And if you systematically disenfranchise those people, you put yourself in danger. Um, and I want to echo, uh, um, um, Alice Hill's point about uh, uh, about just corruption and influence in political systems. That's clearly a profound problem that we have now. And again, it's 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 a failure of our democracy to be democratic. That the rule making and policy making process can be so thoroughly co opted by powerful interests, and that the you know, the people as a whole have so little authoritative um, role in shaping the rules and laws that, you know, that will determine their lives, that determine their fates. Um, and so there's a lot of reform that we need to do to make our democratic systems democratic. And that I think will actually help deal with these problems, make our systems more responsive and make sure that the people who are most likely to suffer are um, empowered to make their voices heard and to change things before bad things happen. Okay, we've got a couple of panelists who want to make a point. I thought I would I just expand on that and say if if our current systems are not 
enormously democratic. Um, and this perhaps one for Roger again. Um, is there are there better ways of getting citizens involved in what um, beyond kind of direct activism? I know there's there's talk in the YouTube live stream there about citizens assemblies. What sort of role do you think that they might play in improving the system? You speaking to me, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, ju I just want to come back just to, to make clear that I think that the, you know, with all due respect and what have you, the, the last three panelists, you know, what you've said is all wishful thinking, you know, ironically, <laughs> because there's no theory of change. There's no actual plan. There's just a wishing that the system will get better. What we need to understand is how systems become better. And in times of like extreme corruption, we know how that works. It comes through popular protest. And we also know from social science over the last 30 years, the most effective mechanism of dealing with governmental corruption and criminality is mass participation, civil disobedience, which means thousands of people disrupting capital cities until governments change or are reformed. What we're talking about here is creating stronger government not less government. That's what the plan is. And the reason why thousands and tens of thousands of people around the world are engaging in civil disobedience is the pennies dropped that establishment organizations and establishment figures have no plan. There's no plan here. And that's why people need to take to the streets. And the other thing to say is, if they don't take to the streets, what we're dealing with in the next 10, 15, 20 years will be violent uprisings. Because when Daily Mail, Daily Mail readers and such like realize that their prosperity has been destroyed by the carbon elite class, they are not going to be happy. They're not going to be committed to nonviolence like, like uh, Extinction Rebellion is. And that's why I'd invite you all, particularly uh, Lord Martin Rees, to come and join us and sit in the road in London just like Bertrand Russell did, right? You know, the aristocrats and the elites used to have some responsibility for the continuation of the nation. But I don't see anything happening in Cambridge University. I don't see any movement by the elite figures in this country to say, I want to actually help save this country from destruction. And the reason for that is very straightforward. It's plain and simple cowardice. There's no sense of honor. There's no sense of duty. There's no sense of putting nation before money. And that's the value system that built this country in the past, is it not? So that would be my challenge, particularly to Martin, but also to Alice and Will, is the game's up. We all know the game's up. And just to be clear, there is a plan. We all know what the plan is. If you read what Extinction Rebellion has to say on the subject, it's all around the world. Ordinary people are taking control of their collective lives through citizens' assemblies. That's randomized selections of citizens making decisions because politicians are completely incapable of doing so. So there's a gradualist and sensible and non-violent solution here, but it does involve going to the streets. And again, that's what I'd invite Cambridge students to do. You know where we are, Extinction Rebellion, look it up. I'm very interested to, to hear from Martin on joining me sitting down in the Strand in September. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, fine. Um, well, let me, say, um, let me say I'm in principle happy to have these peaceful protests in the city, as long as they don't disrupt ordinary people like you did on underground trains and things like that. That was a real own goal from your point of view. Uh, but I think a peaceful disturbance, which doesn't really harm people too much, raises the profile of the issue. And I'm, I want to say that the key thing to do is to make people care about a long-term issue like climate change, when there's always immediate problems like COVID-19. And um, I think um, politicians um, will in fact do the right thing if the voters support them. Uh, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker, maybe not uh, everyone's favorite politician, he famously said um, that people in politics know the right thing to do. What they don't know is how to get re-elected when they've done it and therefore they don't do it. And that is why I think we do want these demonstrations in order to make 
people aware that these are crucial long-term issues and uh, then the politician will do the right thing. Let me take one rather trivial example, um, which was uh, uh, Mr. Gove, not an enlightened man, um, agreeing to have legislation on uh, non-reusable plastic drinking straws and such like. He only did that, and I know it was a very small thing, because um, the David Attenborough programs had made millions of people aware for the first time of the dangers of pollution by plastics in the ocean. He knew that he could make this very minor reform without losing support. And if we can have mega versions of that, where the public does really care and is prepared to make sacrifices, um, then the positive will do it. But going back to Cambridge University, I think that much the most important thing Cambridge University can do is have um, a mega research program to improve batteries, um, to improve other kinds of clean energy and energy storage, for not only the UK, but far more important for India, to make sure that India doesn't have to uh, depend on coal-fired power stations. And indeed, as Will said earlier, um, I think there may be a problem because um, one consequence of the pandemic is that the price of oil has gone right down. So it's even more likely now that India is going to build coal-fired power stations and not renewables. So we've got to bring down the cost of renewables and make them uh, uh, more sophisticated. And that is where a university like Cambridge can really do some good. So I think we ought to uh, uh, inspire young people uh, who are idealistic to do things like that in cl the climate. And also um, we have a major plant science department. And what we need to do is to ensure that we can feed 9 billion people by mid-century. This needs uh, high tech in order to feed everyone um, and uh, avoid encroaching on forests to do it. So here again, it's the expertise which we got, are going to need and which we can develop. Just as in the case of COVID-19, we want expertise to be deployed and that's what universities can do. I thought I was to uh, ask perhaps. Can, um, I, can I just say that presumably, Martin, that means that you would like Cambridge universities to stop being corrupted by oil companies. Um, um, I'm sure you're aware there's the Cambridge Arctic Shelf Programme, there's the BP Institute, which is ploughing money into mass suicide projects of, of taking oil out of the Arctic and such like. So I think this is an opportunity, you know, as an ex uh, Trinity man, as you said you are, to say to Cambridge University, the game's up, get out of oil while you can, where you've got some self-respect as an institution, and rightly, as you say, put your energies into saving humankind rather than destroying it. Isn't that what you would agree with? I think you're probably right, but on the other hand, um, as Bill Gates has said, uh, you may be more effective if you're an activist shareholder rather than selling your shares, which are a tiny fraction and make very little difference. So I think it's not quite as simplistic as you're saying that you should always disinvest rather than try and influence from inside. Oh, I move the discussion on. I see Will there's put his um, hand up. Is there anything you'd like to weigh in on, on this? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a point about, um, about uh, others in our discussion not having a plan. Um, one of the things that, you know, one of the basic facts, one of the animating facts about democracies is, is just rampant disagreement. People disagree about things. Uh, and, and we need institutions that contain that disagreement to, protect, to, to keep it from you know, always spilling out onto the streets. Now, sometimes there's no alternative. And I think we all are in favor of, of, of peaceful protest that um, creates pressure to make change. Um, but it's very difficult to know what the thresholds are, like how much do you need? Like, like what happens if you get counter protests of a certain size? Like what happens if they do become violent and the police you know, come out and start smacking protesters around, which has been happening in cities all over the country here in the US in the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, it, it, to me, that sounds like wishful thinking that, that, that somehow we're just gonna summon the popular will to mobilize millions of people onto the streets and that they will all be so aligned in their perspective that that will drive policy change in a particular direction and then that will solve the problem or that we'll have people randomly selected 
um, you know, have citizens assemblies or little deliberative democracy, um, you know, experiments, and that what they determine and those things will be considered authoritative by anybody else, um, and that it would be binding in some political way on anyone else. This all seems very wishful to me. Um, I think, you know, the things that my institution is trying to do, which is to, you know, create market structures to incentivize decarbonization is a plan. Um, it's hard, uh, uh, you know, just- With, with, with all due respect, you've, you've been pushing that line for 30 years, right? And carbon emissions have gone up 60% globally in, since 1990, since the scientists told the world that we're heading towards ecological catastrophe. So it's totally like intellectually ridiculous to want to continue to pursue something that's catastrophically failed. Everyone knows that civil disobedience well, is we, guaranteed. We, to work. Let, we should we, but, should we uh, a bit more? Uh, will rather a little bit more room just to just to expand on his proposals there for a second. Um, well, I was just going to mention that that you know it, like this is the kind of establishment uh, institution that we're all skeptical of. But you know, Goldman Sachs, you know, just recently reported that clean energy investment will outpace oil and gas exploration for the first time next year, and we barely started. And so if we can incentivize that stuff, change the relative prices in significant ways that drive really significant innovation um, and reduce um, carbon consumption, we can make a difference. Um, the fact that so far um, it has you know, not come about in a, as rapidly as it needs to is a problem, but I don't think it's a problem that can be solved by having um, some alternative out of left field, which is just hoping that a bunch of people will show up and demand change and then change will happen. That seems incredibly wishful to me. We could probably debate this um, all day long and I'm aware that it is six o'clock. So I thought I would give the last word to Alice who um, hasn't spoken for a little while. I wondered what you've thought, um, given that you've worked at the top of government, um, what you've thought of the attitudes of policymakers were and whether um, they have our best interests at heart and how productive you think that can be as an avenue for change. Well, I had the extraordinary experience of working on President Obama's climate team. And of course, in our nation at that time, uh, there were some that were not in agreement with uh, the executive orders that President Obama issued. But I saw how uh, if you pull the forces and the great resources and strength of the federal government toward a solution that uh, could be widely perceived within that government and beyond as the right thing to do, you could uh, direct the ship. The problem we have now is we have uh, a great uh, change in uh, populism. We have an anti-science agenda that has uh, materialized and all of that will hold us back because at the heart of this is of course science. We are all counting on the scientific modeling and prediction that this will occur. We see evidence on the ground, but we have to trust that's right. And that has been proven to be a weak link. I have to agree that I don't think just people on the street will necessarily change that. But if COVID has taught me anything, it's that we need global governance. We're in this together. We're interconnected in ways we never appreciated. And we're going to have to find means to work together that are positive, science-based, and that can drive us to a better place. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Alice. Um, I think that probably ought to bring us uh, to an end to our discussions this evening, although I'm sure the debate will roll on in the comments section for quite a while to come. Um, it's been very contentious, but hopefully very illuminating indeed. And I'd like to thank all of our panellists uh, for being here tonight, as well as our viewers at home for watching. Wherever you are, I hope you stay safe and preferably stay at home. We've got one more exciting event coming up at the Union uh, at this term, so do keep a look on our Facebook page uh, for that. In the meantime, um, have a wonderful time and a wonderful evening. That's all from us. <laughs>